pleasant good morning to everybody. So this morning, we will uh, continue with uh, where we left off last week. And last week, we did talk about the plan of salvation. And to continue with that, we will be discussing <clears throat> what are you waiting for. According to our scripture reading in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, and let me read to you that again. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You know, my dear brethren, life is a waiting game, so they say. And uh, they said that uh, life is also a waiting game of death. I know for a fact that if not all, majority of people living now in this planet Earth know that life is temporary. Right? And I guess you all uh, agree. Then the majority of people know that after this life, there will be another place where we will spend our eternity or as they say, our final abode, our final place. And it might be eternal torment or in eternal joy. Right? So that's why our life here is a waiting game of death. In one movie I watch, uh, there's this old couple. Uh, they're talking to each other. And the wife told her husband that, you know, we are just living each day waiting for our death. Now, who comes next is we don't know. Only God knows. It's a sad reality of life, my dear brethren and friends, but that's how God designed it to be. That's why many people don't want to look, you know, don't want to look their uh, high school yearbook, the school yearbook, because as they turn the pages of that yearbook, many of those smiling faces are just a memory. And uh, when I go out of the house, uh, when I go out in our street back home, and I look around and walk and look around our neighborhood and see old and new houses, it reminds me of my friends. It reminds me of those friends of mine who had gone ahead of me. And as I look at our main house, it reminds me of happy moments and a flashback, so to speak, of our lives together with my family. And it reminds me of sad things because it reminds me of uh, the three uh, individuals in the family who had gone on before us our dad, our mom, and our eldest brother. But again, that is life. That is the reality of life. We all have to accept that fact. Now, in one article I read, a question is asked, is life just a waiting game for those few inexplicably happy moments until death? Are we just trying to live for that happy moments to come? And then the question is, then what? Then what? Now, let me give you an example. A five-year-old kid excited to go to school, right? And then after entering that grade school, that kid is now excited to go into high school. And after that, he is excited to go to college. And after that, he cannot wait to finish college because he is excited to have a job, be on his own. He is excited to have his own apartment. He is excited uh, to earn a living. He is excited to live independently. And he is excited to pursue his dream. And also, in that dream, he is excited to marry a wonderful woman, have kids, have family of his own. Then after all, this kid then everything, the question is, then what? You will grow old. 
you will be weak and you will be fragile. Then everybody around you started disappearing. Your friends, your loved ones, and even your kids will disappear from you. Why? Because they will leave the house and they will have the family of their own. So soon, you started the two of you, you will end up the two of you. That's why in that movie, the wife said to the husband, we are just living, waiting for our death. Now, again, a sad reality, but that's how life is. Now, with all the happy moments in your life, all that you accomplish in life, the, the, the moment when you realize that life will soon be over, the question is, will all of those things matter when you face judgment, when you face your creator? Now, isn't it they say that life is about enjoying life to the fullest? You know, I heard that many times. Live your life to the fullest. Enjoy life to the fullest. Now, if that's just how we view life, and indeed we enjoy life to the fullest, then the question is, why are so many people are worried about dying? Why are we worried about death if life is just living to the fullest? And if you live your life to the fullest, then why are you worried? Why are you worried? Are we not supposed to be happy because we fulfilled life's purpose to be happy? Are we not supposed to be glad that finally we are going home to God in heaven now, maybe we are worried because we don't know if we are going there. Or we know for a fact that we are not really going there. Rather, we are going into eternal torment. The question, what are you waiting for? We are going to discuss three events in the Bible. Number one is the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, Verse 5 and 12, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. In verse 12, God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Now, for sure, these people in the days of Noah, they lived their life to the fullest. They leave their heart's desire. They are corrupted. They were corrupted in all its ways. And they probably laughed at Noah when Noah was building the ark. Now, they probably thought him as a madman building an ark where there's no rain. Then Noah, probably he went around and asked them to turn away from their sins and turn to God. Now, well, for sure, they never believed Noah and they never believed in God because the Bible said every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was only evil all the time. Now, can you just imagine the surprise of the people when it started to rain? They thought that Noah was a madman. They thought he was crazy. And then can you imagine that? They were surprised to see that the rain, the thought there is rain, and rain is pouring down on them. Then when it did not stop raining, now you can imagine the panic. They are now starting to panic because the rain is not stopping. And then probably they all run towards the ark. Probably they are shouting at Noah. Probably they are banging at the door of the ark and begging Noah to open the door for them. But unfortunately, to no avail, and they all perish. They all died in the flood. Now, those people, they live their life to the fullest. They did what they want to do. Now, they know that life has its end, but they never listen to God. They did what their heart desired to do, and they perished. Now, they saw Noah building the ark, but they never cared. 
Probably they never cared to ask Noah about God's plan. Now the question is, what are they waiting for? What are those people waiting for? Another story in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, chapter 13. Now, we, we read of the, uh, the 12 men, each representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they went up to explore the land of Canaan, which God promised to give to them. Right? So the 12 representatives from the 12 tribes, they went up, they explored the land, and when they get back to the council, they testify that indeed, Canaan is a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, among those 12 individuals, 10 of them, 10 of them out of the 12 reported that it will be impossible for them to conquer Canaan. They reported, you know, we cannot just go there and conquer the land because according to them, in Numbers chapter 13, verses 28, 30, and 31, but the people who live there are powerful. They reported that the people there are powerful and the cities are fortified very large. We even saw descendants of Anak. Then Caleb silenced the people. Caleb was one of the two who opposed the ten, along with Joshua. So then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possessions of the land for we certainly for we can certainly do it but the man who had gone up with him said we cannot attack those people they are stronger than we are so the ten contended no, we cannot just go there and conquer it because they are stronger than us we are like just a grasshopper to them according to the scripture now in verses 32 and 33, now this 10, they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. All the people we saw there are of great size. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. So they made a bad report to the people, and the people, they were terrified. They were terrified. And then in Numbers 14, chapter 14, 1 to 4, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if we only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now we see the usual grumbling of the people of the Israelites. They even wanted to replace Moses. Because of the bad report of the stand people, they grumbled against God. And they wanted Moses to be out as their leaders or as their leader. And they wanted to return to Egypt. Now, despite the plea of Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua not to rebel against God, they rebel against God. They did not listen to them. They continued to grumble against God and rebel against God. And this is what the Lord God had to say against them in Numbers 14. Verse 11 and 12, the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs I have performed among them, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Now, true to the word, or true to his word, God did what he told Moses he would do. So the man Moses had sent to explore the land, who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it, these men who were responsible for spreading the bad report 
about the land were struck down and died of a plague for the Lord. Now with so many things God did to the people of Israelites, so many miracles God made to them, God showed to them while they were still in Egypt, including the ten plagues. They, God even departed the Red Sea for them to escape the Egyptians. Now these people still were full of unbelief and always wanted their way. God never left their side. God was always with them. He was always with them since the exile in Egypt until this very moment. Now, ever since God promised Canaan to them, that God would give them Canaan and they will be a great nation. And as they, and as they explore Canaan, Canaan is just right over there for them, ready for the taking. Now, the question is, what are they still waiting for from God? Why are they afraid? God promised them to give them Canaan, but still they were afraid. What are they waiting for? In the New Testament, in the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, now we will see some of the things that Jesus Christ did. You know, I thought that people live with the saying to cease to believe. I thought we live in that mantra, but apparently not. Seeing is not believing. In John chapter 12, verse 37, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Yeah, many say to see is to believe. But many people have seen the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ and not yet had not believed in him. When Jesus raised Lazarus in John chapter 11, many who saw believed in him. But unfortunately, many were not pleased with what he did because they want to arrest him. But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him in John chapter 11 in the last verse. Now, not only did these people arrest our Lord Jesus Christ, but they crucified him. Now, very ironic and quite odd, despite Jesus' miracle and wisdom, now look at what the Jews and what the Greeks were waiting for. The Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. You see, the Jews specifically were looking for a sign. They were looking for a sign from heaven, a, a miraculous messianic deliverance that would put them in the social, economic, and political advantage, and not anymore the minority. They were anticipating, you know, a, a king-like figure, a regal man with many horsemen that will take down the Roman Empire and establish the Jews as the new race in power. And that's what the Jews were waiting. Now, the, the, the miracles <clears throat> that Jesus did, it was nothing to them. It was nothing. Because they were expecting a miracle that would put them in power. You know the first humiliation that, the, uh, that Jesus brought to the Jews? When Jesus was born in a manger. For them, it's a humiliation. To be declared and to be uh, prophesied that a king would be born and yet the way Jesus was born was in a manger coming from a poor family. For them it was a humiliation. Then there was his crucifixion. 
it was a stumbling block for the Jews. You know, claiming to be king and dying a criminal's death was humiliating for the Jews. Now, the cross, it was not a sign they were looking for. It was not. They were not even looking for the message of the cross. For again, the cross for them is utterly offensive for them. Now, on the other hand, the Greeks were looking for wisdom. They were looking for wisdom. Even with the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's nothing for the, for the Greeks. In the Greek culture, you know, they valued academic achievements. They value that. In our time today, that will be equivalent to graduating from Harvard, graduating from Cambridge, and, you know, having master's degree, having PhD, having other degree or higher, having uh, all of those things. But Jesus had none of those. So for the Greeks, they were looking for wisdom. And they did not find it in Jesus Christ. They did not value the wisdom expressed in the message of the cross that Paul was so proud of. No. For the Jews, uh, for, for the Greeks, it was foolishness to them. For someone claiming to be God and die a cruel death, not able to save himself, is total nonsense for the Greeks. They call it folly or foolishness. Now, the question is, what are these people waiting for? Despite all the stories in the Bible, so many miracles, so many signs, so many wonders that God did, you know, uh, the story of the flood, God's de deliverance, The story of Moses, the story of the Israelites, the story of Jesus Christ. So many miracles until this very moment, still many people don't believe in Jesus Christ. You see, the problem is the stubbornness of man's heart. The stubbornness of our hearts. From time immemorial, my dear brethren, from the creation until this very day, we all want it our ways. I want it my way. You want it your way. People want it their way, not Jesus' way. We are thinking to ourselves that yielding to Christ is giving away our freedom. Our freedom to live the way we want to live our lives. The reality, my dear brethren, is that our belief in Jesus is confined to what is convenient to us. And that is true. Just like the misconceptions about salvation, like what I shared last week. You know, we will only do and believe those that are convenient to us. We don't want to follow Christ or we don't want to follow other commandment of Christ because it is not convenient for us. We will only choose what is convenient to us. And normally I refer this as selective righteousness. Now, despite of all God's revelation, the question still remains, my dear brethren and friends, what are you waiting for? Why are you still in your sins? Just like the story of the flood, those of Moses who surveyed Canaan, their sins went up to God, and God already decided that they will destroy them, that he will destroy them. Now, probably with the best efforts of the people during Noah's time to repent, but unfortunately, it was too late. Nothing they can do to save them. Just like in the book of Nahum, chapter 3, verse 19. Now, it, the, the, that verse ends with a rhetorical question regarding the reason for Nineveh's coming destruction. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Because of, they, 
because of their great sin to God, the Bible tells us nothing can heal their wound, meaning nothing they can do to escape God's wrath. Nothing they can do to escape the impending judgment of God upon them because their injury is already fatal. Now, the other half of our scripture reading, it says, get up. Now, I want everybody to remember this. <clears throat> when we reach, when you reach that point of no return, nothing you can do to make amends to your sins. And nobody can help you to avoid the penalty of eternal damnation. Just like what happened to the people during the flood. Just like what happened to the people during the time of Moses in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. At the time or at the point of no return, when God already decided that they will feel His wrath, nothing can escape it. The Bible tells us nobody knows when our time is up. Now, when you reach that point of no return, again, nothing you can do to make amends. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 12, Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpected, unexpectedly upon them. And look at what the analogy says. It says, like fish and like birds, that are caught up unexpectedly. No, they cannot escape. So is the man. So are you and so am I. When we are so busy living our lives to the fullest, when all of a sudden death showed up or we, were, or we are stricken with a terrible disease that we become a decaying or a withering plant, there's no escaping the wrath of God. You know, we are so trapped by the devil's scheme of going and doing our heart's desire that we forget about our Creator. Then unexpectedly, our strength and our life was taken away from us. That's why the Bible reminds us that we only live once, and I know for a fact that people know that life will come to an end and any time without even reading the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 9, man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. You know, my dear brethren and friends, we must get up and see that we only have one shot at life. Apostle Paul, you know, knowing pretty much and pretty well that we only have one shot at life, encourages us on how to live. Ephesians 5.16, it tells us, pay careful attention then how you walk, not as advice, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Pay careful attention, according to Apostle Paul. Paul wants us, number one, to be mindful. Mindful on the way we walk this earth. Mindful to our ways to, you know, to automatically to go back to the right line, to the right lane, or to the right path if we are slowly drifting away from God. We must be mindful. Mindful of our acquaintances with other people so that our character will not be corrupted. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, bad company corrupts good morals. So we must be mindful on how we acquaint ourselves with other people and mindful that instead of being corrupted, the Bible also tells us to overcome good with evil. Then he wants us not only to be mindful, he wants us to be intentional. Intentional in how we live as he advises us to be wise. Not as unwise, but as wise. It means that we use, you use your analytical mind for proper discernment 
and for proper judgment. So you won't suffer the same fate as those people in the time of Noah, in the time of Moses, because Apostle Paul said, the days are evil. Now putting those things in mind, mindfulness, being intentional, these things will lead us to a decision that we will never feel sorry for and we will never regret in our lifetime. It will lead us to the action, you know, of getting up because we know the consequence of not heeding the word of God because we know that if we will not follow God's way of salvation, then we will suffer the consequence of his wrath. Paying careful attention to how we live opens our hearts and minds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus says, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. Here lies a dead person. January 1, 1900-blank. I want you to notice the small dash. The small dash. The small dash represents two things. Two things. Number one, the dash is so small. It means that our time, our life here on earth is short. Nobody can live forever. Nobody. Our time is short. And the dash also represents unknown. Unknown. It means you do not know when your time will be up. You do not know what will happen tomorrow. I do not know what will happen right after I deliver the message of God. I do not know. Only God knows. And that's the fact. Life is short and life is unknown. You don't know when your time, my time, will be up. And this person's time was up just for 20 years. Many people even died shorter years. Many goes up to 100. But we don't know. We don't know. Now, brethren, as we have accepted Jesus Christ into our life and did our part to obtain the plan of salvation or obtain the salvation, you know, faithfulness is the key until the D-Day. You and I, we must need to be faithful. Never let go. Never let go. Now, to those who have not yet accepted Jesus in the proper manner, he taught us to do, please, I want you to ask yourself again the question, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I will leave you with the scripture from Hosea chapter 12, verse 6. I'm reading it from the message translation of the Bible. It says, what are you waiting for? Return to God. Commit yourself in love, in justice. Wait for your God and don't give up on Him. Don't give up on God. Never let go. Ever. God bless my dear brothers and sisters. To God be the Lord.